Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Human Medicine, written by MWMN19. I was always a curious pup, striving to learn more, always asking questions about everything and anything. But it wasn't until I was older, until I was already a proper adult, that I found my true core. And that was medicine. For countless eons, my people fought to find a way to extend our lives, to cast off our mortal coil. We knew that it was impossible, not only on a biological level, but also on a philosophical level. One's mind, no matter how advanced and intelligent, can't handle a life that long. We had our struggles, we had our wars, where the medical field was expanded. We had medical teams save many wounded soldiers from certain death. My people, weren't known for their warlike behavior. We were a peaceful people, for the most part. We had no major conflicts, or at least major conflicts compared to other people of the galaxy. I studied history and knew well enough about the brutality of combat and what problems may arise in men medical sense. But even with our advanced techniques and technology, the ability to regrow limbs, to bring back the dead to the world of the living, there are simply some cases where the die has been cast and nothing can be done. I've lived through a war, a peacekeeping operation to be exact. The weapons used in modern sophisticated warfare are such that a single good hit and you're done. Rarely do soldiers who were shot return back to life. Even if they do, they are a lost cause. Being a man of medicine, a doctor, my duty was to my patients, no matter their race or creed. I studied the biologies and physiologies of various people of the galaxy. Though even with the help of AI and neurological enhancers, there is simply too much to take in. Sometimes my lack of knowledge meant the death of another. I had no other choice but to give up. I cannot begin to describe that feeling. That feeling of seeing those soldiers' desperation, their pleas, and me being unable to do anything to comfort them. Death as it seems, is here to stay no matter how much we advance. Virtually all my fellow men and women of medicine accepted that as fact, no matter the race or frame of mind. It was a simple, if depressing, fact. After I returned home, completely disheartened, I felt that I needed guidance. For all my professionalism, I still felt, especially in those moments in the bunkers of that foreign world, helpless, like a newly born pup. I sought guidance at the place where I felt most at home, and that was in the Institute of Xenobiology and Medicine on my home planet. I remember I walked solemnly to those gates, through which a long time ago I exited, filled with hope and happiness, a feeling of great accomplishment. Yet here I am today, once again entering, a complete contrast. I entered the institute, walking through the halls which I remembered so vividly, full of color, now only empty, dull and sterile white and gray greeted me. How blind I was to reality back then, as if a filter had been lifted from my eyes. I walked up to an office of a professor which I knew well. In front of the office, a neon blue light read, Office of Professor Yatran Kalan, in Galactic Standard, and my native language. I knocked. I heard an unfamiliar voice reply from the other side, Come in! I opened the door, but I wasn't greeted by the light brown furred professor, but a pale pinkish figure with white fur only on top of its head and on its face. Oh, I apologize. I must have been mistaken. Now leave, I said as I turned to close the door. Are you perhaps looking for Professor Yatran? The person said, standing up from its chair. I stopped before looking back and said, Yes. Yes, I am. At that moment, I took a better look at the person in the office. I recalled working with a similar race before. I've also studied that race before. A human. I know, I know, it's quite rare to see someone other than your own in a place of high learning. Especially here on your own planet, the human said with a chuckle. I am on an exchange program if you're curious. Professor Yatran will be back in around a week, give or take. I can leave a message if you like, the human continued. I thought for a few moments before replying. You 
are a professor of medicine, I assume. Why, yes, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't. The human sat back down and looked at me for a few moments. Oh, God, excuse my manners. I am Professor Rotlieb, Kenneth Rotlieb. He extended his hand. I stood in silence for a moment before recalling that this is a human greeting. I took a few steps forward and extended my hand in earnest, shaking it. Matran Falan, it is a pleasure to meet you, I said. Likewise, the professor said, then continued. Are you a student here, or, uh, I, uh, I don't recall seeing you before. I was a student here. I studied xenobiology here, earning a doctorate. I served as a combat medic. I, uh, just returned from duty, I said, looking to the side. The human's brows raised. Have a seat, please, he asked. I obliged and sat down across from him in the comfortable chair. I know Professor Yatran well. He told me he had many students come to him not only for his expertise in the field of study, but also for some life advice, Professor Rotlieb said, having leaned his back onto his chair. I, uh, you then know why I'm here. I'm sorry. I don't want to bother you, I said, preparing myself to stand up but the professor gestured me to stay. Stay, Matran, or should I say Dr. Matran? I know very well why you are here, because I was in the same position as you when I was younger. I studied in the same field as you, xenobiology, before I felt the obligation to save my fellow humans and others from the madness of war, he said, looking into my eyes. I could see it inside of them. He saw the same thing. He saw worse. Much, much worse even. I sat back down. My head lay low into my lap. Let me hear it. Tell me everything, he said. I sighed heavily before starting to recount my experiences before, during, and after the peacekeeping mission. As I spoke, I could see the professor listening intently, hanging on every word I uttered. And, uh, so I came here, looking for advice, for guidance. Because, uh... I feel like a failure. The professor stared, probably thinking of an answer before replying. My story will do you no good, I know that. Because I felt the same way in those tired times. I don't know whether or not you are familiar with human history. I shook my head. I knew some things, but I wouldn't say that I was informed. I knew the gist. In short, it was brutal, he said, before sighing and starting to recount the history of mankind and its struggles with death and war. 1099 AD, Jerusalem. Physician! I pulled out of my stupor. My hands were smeared in red, and my face spilled with a sweat both from stress and the immense heat from the underground cavern where the wounded were plowed. Yes, I shouted back, getting back to my feet and rushing towards the voice. It was hard to tell from the moaning and screams, both from inside and outside but I finally managed to find two men going down the stone steps. One of the soldiers had an arrow stuck in his neck. Lay him down here, now, I yelled, and pointed at the free spot in the ground. The warrior clad in chainmail whined and moaned. I carefully started to undress his headgear. The moment it left his head, blood started to flow. I retrieved a knife from my person and cut the arrow shaft as far as the neck as I could. You, I shouted to a young squire next to me. He was shaking. Honey and wax now! He nodded and ran. I looked at the wound. Blood was coming out like a river. Can, can, can you save my brother? The warrior who brought him in told me. I looked at him. I'll do my best. Soon the young boy came back with a jar of honey and a handful of wax. I quickly opened it and had a quick taste to confirm. I grabbed the wax. After that, I scooped a handful of honey and applied it to the wound. After that, I applied some wax in hopes that it would stop the bleeding. I turned back to the brother of the wounded warrior. Hold it, and do not let it go. I got up. I had other men that I had to tend to. Time passed. After what felt like ages, I returned to the wounded warrior and his brother. He was still diligently holding the wound with all of his might. But I could see from afar, he was dead. I could see the tears form in the young man as he held the wound, he was a junior, no more than sixteen. I crossed myself, hoping that God may have mercy on his soul. Wax, honey, no, not that. November 2nd, 1914. Ypres, Belgium. Over the top, 
and that whistle, I could only imagine the apprehension the soldiers felt. But their job was to follow orders, and follow the orders they did. Working at a field hospital was as much a hell as it was in the trenches themselves. Every single day, hundreds came in. Injuries varied from gunshot wounds, shrapnel wounds, dismemberment, disease was also prevalent. There was a slight moment of calm. I could hear the artillery in the distance. But I took that ever so slight reprieve from my job to recuperate my energy. That calm never lasted long. I heard shouts and yells outside. You batch, I'll prepare the beds. A nurse said to another. They got to their job. Space was thin as it was. As for myself, I prepared myself for the worst. I was a surgeon after all. The door was opened and the wounded were quickly brought inside. And almost immediately, I was called upon. Surgeon! A young man was on a stretcher. He was moaning, his skin pale, and his eyes wide and bloodshot. His right leg was completely shredded from the knee down. His right hand, bloody and limp. A fellow surgeon, an older gentleman with much more experience than myself, stepped in, inspecting the soldier. He simply shook his lips. I saw his lips move. I couldn't hear him, but I could tell what he had said. He's already dead. I quickly stepped in. Dr. Higgins, I'll take this one, I said to him. He looked at me. Son, I can't tell. I'll do everything I can to save the man, I said with conviction. Nurse, instruments. Minutes later, I was ready to begin the operation. I had to be quick. We tore the man's uniform. His arm was littered with shrapnel. And his leg had to be amputated and disinfected as quickly as possible. The arm was going to be a problem as well. I gave the soldier a soft pad and bite down on when he applied the alcohol for disinfection. He did little to alleviate the pain. He screamed and thrashed with the remaining limbs he could move. Two more nurses had to hold him down. Then the song. We couldn't bring him to the guillotine. We had to do it right here and now. I put the saw just below his knee and began the amputation. I saw this quickly as humanly possible. The man's blood-curdling screams pierced through the building, tears running down his face, his face once pale now red from the force he put down on the pad. In a matter of seconds, I managed to amputate his leg. We had to stop the bleeding. Even if we did, infection was highly likely. The wounds were dirty despite the use of alcohol for disinfection. After fighting for minutes on end with the bleeding, there was no coming back from this. Too much chaos, too much stress. I gave everything I have, but I couldn't do anything. The man lay upon the table, pale, without a pulse. Dead. But damn, they tried, Rotlieb continued. We had those who strive to find immortality, like your people. But they always achieve little to nothing. Only through sheer willpower and desperation do we find ways of combating death. The professor looked down at the table as if pondering what to say next. Listen. Hundreds of years ago, my ancestors, much like your own, were helpless when in the hands of death and injury. But both mankind and your kind, I'm sure, learn through difficulty, through necessity... A man of medicine doesn't quit when he loses a patient. He finds his mistake and corrects them. So the next one might not suffer the same fate as the previous one. They sacrifice in the name of science one life for what might be dozens, hundreds, if not thousands. In the madness of war, there is no one at fault but those who issued the orders. So, next time when you question yourself, remember... You are saving the lives of soldiers who are not there of their own choice, who are thrown into pits of hell for no reason. Especially in this era we live in today, an era of abundance. So remember the men who have died here. Do not let their deaths be in vain, because everything you know and have learned has its foundation upon a mountain of bodies. End of story. I would quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and Patreons. Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Barky, Lord Azrakal, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Dragzoon WRE, Holly's Sister, Arcadian. Thank you very much.